Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to finally have a look at Weil's main theorem. So we'll start out by reviewing what we talked about over the past couple of videos. We took a prime P at least three. We took a field K of characteristic P, a finite field. We looked at a Galois representation rho naught from GQ to GL2K. And we imposed four conditions on rho naught. First, we wanted it to have mod P cyclotomic determinant. Second, we wanted it to be semi-stable. Third, we wanted it to be absolutely irreducible. Fourth, we wanted it to be modular. And we wanted it to be the case that when you restrict rho naught to the Galois group of Q adjoin root negative three, we get an absolutely irreducible representation. Okay. We also saw last video that a deformation type is like a list of conditions we want to impose on certain deformations of rho naught. If I give you a deformation type D, then under the conditions A through D above, there are universal deformation rings R, D, and T, D, each equipped with a universal type D deformation. R, D corresponds to like the ultimate or the biggest, diagrammatically speaking, type D deformation of rho naught. And T, D and its deformation, that corresponds to the ultimate or again, like the diagrammatically biggest type D modular deformation of rho naught, okay? To press on, we're going to need some commutative algebra. So first, the crawl dimension of a commutative ring. A is the supremum of lengths of chains of prime ideals in A. So we're taking like nested chains of prime ideals like 0 to P1 to P2 and so on. And we're saying, all right, what's the supremum of the lengths of all possible chains in my ring? That supremum, that's the dimension of the ring. A regular local ring is an Noetherian local ring A, such that the minimal number of generators of its unique maximal ideal equals the dimension of the ring. Essentially what's going on here is these have some nice geometric smoothness type properties. Okay, so I won't get too much into the geometry there, but we like regular local rings as stocks. If A is a commutative ring, a list of elements A1 through AN will be called a regular sequence in A. If A1 is a non-zero divisor of A, A2 is a non-zero divisor of A mod the ideal generated by A1, A3 is a non-zero divisor of A mod the ideal generated by A1 and A2, and so on. Again, there's some geometry going on here. We like uh, when we cut varieties with hypersurfaces and the dimension of each component shrinks. Yeah, we've, we've liked that since linear algebra class. Maybe we just didn't realize it. So that's what's going on with regular sequences. Okay, and then let's put this all together. A complete intersection ring. It's a very nice, organized, well-behaved type of ring. It's an Noetherian local ring R with a maximal ideal M, such that when you complete it, giving you R hat, let's say, with respect to its maximal ideal M, you can think of completion in the usual analysis way if you like, if you've never seen algebraic completion before. So it's going to be called a complete intersection ring if it's Noetherian regular local, and its completion is isomorphic to A mod I, where A is a regular local ring, and I is an ideal generated by a regular sequence. Okay, a little bit more commutative algebra. So a discrete valuation ring, there are many equivalent definitions here, but I'll give the simplest one. I don't feel like explaining valuations from the beginning. So I'll just say it's a principal ideal domain. So every ideal is generated by one element with exactly one non-zero maximal ideal. All right, finally, let's let A be a ring and let's let I and A be an ideal. The annihilator of I in A is written and sub A of I, and it's the set of everything in A that kills everything in I. That, that's all it is. It's the set of all elements A and big A, such that AX equals zero for all X and I. All right, I think we have enough commutative algebra to actually state Weil's main theorem, so let's do that. Let's return to, the, to Weil's proof now. All right, so keep this in mind, right? We have, let's draw a little picture. So we have the Galois group here. We have rho naught going to GL2K. Then we've got this universal type D deformation, rho D, headed up to GL2 of RD. Okay. But remember, we also have a universal modular deformation, rho DM, headed up to GL2 TD. Okay. Well, every deformation, modular or not, filters through or rho D in some sense, right? And so, rho dm will filter through rho d. And so by the universal property of rho d, there's a unique ring homomorphism, which I'll call phi d, from rd to td, commuting this diagram here. You see? And so here's the remarkable theorem of Wiles, a special case of it, the only case we need. 
Suppose row not satisfies conditions A through D listed above. Then the map FD from RD to TD, it's an isomorphism of complete intersection rings. This is huge. If you've ever seen any pop documentaries or read any popular articles or books on Fermat's last theorem, you might have seen that there was a commutative algebra step, they call it. And you might have seen that step called R equals T. That's this step. Okay, so we'll give a quick sketch of the proof of this next time. But let me just say for now, the, a driving force behind the proof is what's called Wiles numerical criterion. And here's what it says. Let R and T be coefficient rings. They're gonna be our R, D and our T, D above. Let O be a complete discrete valuation ring. Suppose we have a commutative diagram of surjective arrows. So one from R to T, then one from R to O, one from T to O. We'll call the, the new maps here, pi R and pi T. Let's let I R be the kernel of pi R. Let's let I T be the kernel of pi T. So these are subgroups in R and T, or ideals even. And we'll let eta sub t be pi of pi sub t of the annihilator of the kernel of pi sub t. So you've got the kernel in here. It's got an annihilator in here. And then eta sub t will be the image of that annihilator in O. Then the following three things are equivalent. Phi is an isomorphism of complete intersection rings, which is what we want. IR mod IR squared is finite and its size is less than or equal to the size of O mod eta sub t. And I sub R mod I sub R squared is finite and its size is equal to the size of O mod eta sub t. I will be covering this criterion in chapter 11, but Wiles essentially you know, shows that we have a, a commutative diagram of surjective arrows pretty easily. And then he shows that the phi, the phi sub d that we're after from R d to t sub d, he shows that's a nice amorphism of complete intersection rings by invoking step two here. We'll be talking a little bit about this next video. Okay, and then kind of crucial corollary to Weil's main theorem, the modularity lifting theorem. Okay, this is a special case of Mazur's lifting conjecture. Here's what it says. Suppose rho naught satisfies conditions A through D. Then every type D deformation of rho naught is modular. This is huge. Okay, let's talk about the proof of this. So here's what's going on. So here, so take GQ, send it to GL2K via rho naught. Okay, go ahead and pick yourself some lifting out. Let's call it rho to GL2 of A. Okay, we claim rho is modular. The point though, is that I know that I can lift rho through phi r, or phi d, excuse me, or r d, whatever, to gl2 of r d, okay? So in other words, there's a unique ring homomorphism, r d to a, commuting this diagram up here, okay? But r d is isomorphic to t d by Weyl's main theorem. So actually I get a unique ring homomorphism t d to a, well, here's what's going on. We know by the universal property of the unique ring homomorphisms from TD to A, commuting these lifting diagrams with rho D replaced by rho DM and RD replaced by TD, that what must happen is the elf heck operator T sub L in TD here must be sent to the trace of rho of Frobenius at L for primes outside sigma D, and not dividing and, and unramified, not dividing P or the conductor of rho naught. But the thing is, because this is a ring homomorphism from the Hecke algebra, it's easy to show, and we'll talk about this in chapter three and in chapter 12, that this map also must be of the form TL to ALF for some new form F. But then you have trace of rho frob L equaling ALF for all but finitely many primes. And so by the properties of Galois presentations attached to new forms that I covered in a previous video, you actually have that rho, rho itself must be isomorphic to rho f. And so there you go, your, def your deformation is modular by definition, okay? So the key point here is if you have a mod p Galois representation satisfying conditions a through d, then every single type d deformation of it for any deformation type d 
is modular. And we'll look at a sketch of a proof of Weil's main theorem next time. So thanks for watching.